Hi, everybody. Happy Father's Day to all of you at both of our campuses and to all those watching online. Welcome. We're glad you're here. We love you and we miss you so much already. Larry and I can't wait to get back with you real soon. Thanks for this great time to be on sabbatical. But as we continue in this series, The One Thing, what's the one thing that you can't live without? Or let me ask the question another way. What's the one thing that you're living for? You see, the most successful people have determined the answer to that question. That question brings extraordinary focus and energy to our lives. And so for this third installment on Father's Day, I've invited someone who's perfect for today. He's no stranger to Heartland. It's Steve Arterburn, everybody. He hosts the number one Christian counseling talk show online, New Life Live. It's heard by millions on radio and Sirius XM. There's a new internet TV station called tv.newlife.com. You've got to go check it out. There they have over 800 topical programs recorded and just available on demand. You know, he's a New York Times best-selling author. He wrote a book that every father and son should read, and it's called Every Man's Battle. You can pick that up today in our lobby, and you can read about his other books in your message notes. But I just want to add, he is the editor of the Life Recovery Bible, which just received an award for being the number one best-selling Bible in the world right now. So you've got to check that out. He's a loving father. He's a wonderful husband to an amazing wife named Misty. They live right here in Fishers. They're part of our church. And Steve's one of my great friends. He's one of the funniest people I know. You're going to laugh today. You're going to be inspired. So open up your heart. Put your hands together. Give a huge welcome to Steve Arterburn, everybody. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. And um, good morning to all of you uh, online or at HSE. Uh, God bless you, and glad that you're all here. Um, I had a message uh, prepared for you, my one thing message. It was about truth. Darren contacted me uh, yesterday and said, given what has happened uh, in our country, uh, I, I need you to write a new sermon, and I need you to talk about uh, what's happened in South Carolina. And so uh, I did. And I would, I'll, maybe sometime I'll give you that other message. But in light of the fact that, and maybe we have their pictures, uh, nine people were killed and one wounded. And uh, real people. Uh, and they're the people that were so faithful that they were in church at a Bible study a prayer meeting on Wednesday night. Um, we just can't ignore that, especially who we are as a multi-generational and a multicultural and a multi-ethnic church here at Heartland. And, I, and that is the very foundation and fabric of the uniqueness of this church. And I wish it were that way all across America. I wish we weren't so unique in that. Today, uh, they are meeting right now, and Ron and Christine Wilson from our congregation decided um, to put on their Heartland t-shirts and drive down there and be with those people today to represent us. That's pretty amazing. And so I want to talk to you about that and where is God in all of this? And what our response uh, needs to be in light of what happened as we, um, as we mourn and grieve for these, not those who are, are gone, but their families who are left, the devastation that is there. Uh, Darren wishes he could be here for this. He expressed his love and gratitude more than ever as he's celebrating his 25th anniversary. But I'm glad I got to be here. Not exactly the message I would want to give. It's no accident that this 21-year-old hater would show up at the Emmanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church. A place where well, it has a history of being a place of violence and abuse. Uh, it was burned down in 1822. All black churches were banned in the South. As the Civil War approached, they were afraid what might be going on in those churches, these places of, 
uh, of sanctuary and, and holiness set apart where no one else was involved in the things of their culture and their life. And the church has always been a place of, of culture and, and heritage for the African American community as it was there and is there in Charleston. The church uh, didn't reform or wasn't rebuilt until 1865 where it became a center where families were helped and, and the culture was reestablished and it became a, a source of great uh, strength for so many. And during the civil rights movement, a place where people came to experience God's grace and God's healing. The pastor there, oh, what a, what a great man. Clementa Pickney, he said in, in 2013, his calling and the calling of that particular church was to be fully integrated. So that when a 21-year-old white, angry, hate-filled, evil-saturated man walked in, they didn't question his color or culture. They welcomed him in. So much so, he says, I thought about not doing what I was there to do. They just welcomed him in. Ironic that the most non-racist place that you could go was the target for a racist so full of hate. And this, um, this white stranger destroyed so many lives, so many hopes, so many dreams, so many things that God had in store. When racism and hatred takes over our, our lives, that's what happens. People are killed. Dreams are shattered. And wounds are produced. It destroys people. When hatred rules the day. And so today, we mourn the loss of those folks. You know, I've been, um, I've been a racist all my life, but not against someone of a different color, but I'm, I'm embarrassed of my own race. I'm ashamed of some of the stuff I've seen. Not, not just in my race, but Christians in my race who who make the headlines because there was uh, some great minister who falls or uh, some uh, minister manipulates people for money so that he can live in extravagance under the guise of the abundant life. Recently, one uh, raising $60 million to fly around in a brand new jet. That's what makes the headlines. Or... Uh, People in the faith sexually abusing children. That makes headlines. Or Christians spewing hatred, holding up signs, telling people who God hates. I, I've always wanted to have a sign that said, God hates people, that holds up signs that say who he hates. <laughs> but you know what? God doesn't hate people that hold up signs of hatred. He loves them too. But that's what people see. Christians spewing hatred. And yet the headlines this week, that wasn't what they heard about Christians. They heard about families standing before this 21-year-old man and saying, I forgive you. Offering mercy and forgiveness rather than bitterness and resentment. I forgive you. Offering grace in the midst of their grief. And oh, you know, sure, they're going to have moments of anger and bitterness and they'll be triggered back into that. But they decided that they would start to build the bridge of forgiveness even as the raging waters of anger still flow or disappointment and grief. They decided to forgive. And it has astounded the news media. They did what Jesus would do. And they are an, an honor uh, to all of us. They have brought glory to God in the midst of the worst of circumstances. Well, I tell you, um, 
It's not easy to go from bitterness and resentment to grace and love. Especially when you see it in somebody that, you know, is representative of your own color. And I'll tell you, if any of you have ever been hurt by some white man or, or woman, I, I apologize for all of us. And I think uh, many of us Christians are embarrassed at the hatred and bitterness that has gone on for way, way too long. And I ask your forgiveness for all of us. But here, Proverbs 12, 20 tells us that deceit fills the hearts that are, are plotting evil. And, and 1 John 2, 11 says, but anyone who hates Another brother or sister is still living and walking in darkness. And such a person does not know the way to go, having been blinded by the darkness. And so when I heard about this, the first question I asked was, where did all this hatred and bitterness in this young man come from? And I wanted to know about his father. And I don't excuse anybody for anything because of a father. But I wanted to understand because hatred breeds hatred. Bitterness grows in the midst of resentment. And so when I found out about this father, the court records reveal that he was a very, very evil man. The stepmother uh, of this boy was the only hope that this boy had. A healthy uh, person who uh, wanted to raise him, and yet the father beat her, stomped on her, smashed the back of her head, and she had to leave when he was 15. He belittled her. He controlled her. He did everything you do out of weakness and hatred and bitterness and evil. He did that, and this boy watched it. When, when the stepmother left at 15, he dropped out of school and went from video games to drugs to video games to drugs. Didn't work. And at 21, this father thought that it would be a good idea to give his son, who he had no idea what he was capable of doing, give his son a 45 caliber pistol that he used to kill these wonderful people. I tell you... Uh, it's a little bit hard for me to love that man. I talked to a woman the other day. She's going to go to prison for two years for driving a car for five minutes while a man ran in and stole something out of a Circle K. But this man won't go to jail, and yet he is an accessory to this crime because he, he is the one that modeled hatred bitterness, resentment, dehumanization that he did for this woman. It is no wonder that we saw what we saw come out of this young man. And I tell you, I'll get there, but it's a little bit hard for me to use the word forgiveness, even though I know God loves that man and wants something so much better for him and loves that boy that took those lives. And so, we have to look at this and ask, what does this say to us on Father's Day? Ephesians 6, 4 says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way that you treat them. And I will tell you that uh, it's not just the way you treat them, but it's uh, the way you treat other people too. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15.33 says, Bad company corrupts good character. There's this um, father wound in so many men that come from a dad who is either an addicted dad, uh, an abusive dad, an adulterous dad, an absent dad, an angry dad. I was in a group of... Uh, of men in a recovery group, and, and these men were talking about their fathers. And they were saying things like, he, he remembers his arms up 
wanting his dad to pick him up, and his dad walks right by him to pick up his brother. Never paid him any attention. Another man said, well, when I was born, my dad was in France, and when I was sexually molested, he was in Texas. He was never there for me. So much anger and bitterness and resentment had been let go over the years, but it was not easy for those men. So often the addictions and the habits and the obsessions and compulsions that we have are fueled by an anger toward a father who leaves this father wound, who uh, in the midst of all of this horrible parenting, leave a man wondering, am I a man? And what must I do in this feeling of weakness to feel that I have some kind of power? And so often, the only thing that these vacuous, empty people have that they can point to that's different is the color of their skin. And so they hold that up like that's some big virtue. I don't know if you've... (laughs) If you ever looked at white skin, it is so ugly. Our skin is so ugly. And my, my, my African-American, my black friends, their skin, I look at their skin. One of my favorite people, Thelma Wells, that speaks for women of faith. We were in a slave prison in Ghana together. We walked through there where these, these uh, people had been held before they were shipped here. And we cried and we sang together and... I looked at her skin. It's just so beautiful. And yet, it's different. So somebody says, mine's better. And that's all they've got to hold on to. Oh, it's so sad. It's so weak. It's so pitiful. And so in the absence of a great dad, every uh, exchange with another person is looked at by a son. Every mistreatment of a spouse, his mother, is looked at. Uh, Some stranger cuts you off in traffic. The boy is watching the reaction. Road rage in the midst of some stranger who doesn't know you, you don't know them. That says something to a young man. That there is bitterness and anger and resentment and hatred inside that gets triggered at the drop of a traffic infraction. We need to evaluate. Our our response to this is to not just look at some evil father and some evil son, but to look at the evil within us and decide that we will not let those people die in vain. We will become better. We will take a look at what we do. And if we came in here with any resentment or bitterness, which God says get rid of all bitterness, although we think we're so justified in our anger, our bitterness, our resentment, if we brought any of that in, we need to leave it here. We need to surrender it to God and let Him have it rather than walk out of here with it. My my son Solomon on his mirror uh, I put this, this little verse, James 1.19. It says, Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters. You must be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. It's my job to teach him how to deal with his anger. It's my job as a father. It's all father's jobs to help a boy contain his anger. That when they're young and they're angry, we need to pick them up and hold them. And contain them so that they can then learn to do it themselves. We don't teach them how to deal with anger by tacking a little verse on their mirror. We do it with how we react and how we respond. And if we've got anger and if that's what some boy is seeing in us, a son is seeing in us, we need to get rid of every single bit of that anger and let God have it. I am wearing two-tone shoes today. I don't know if you've noticed. I don't know if you can see them. They might be considered a bit obnoxious to some of you, but my father wore two-tone shoes. And I am in my 20th year without my dad. And so I saw these on sale, and I said, I'm going to wear these on Father's Day when I preach. (laughs) In honor of my father... 
who gave me truth and he gave me talent and he gave me his time and he gave me his touch and he wasn't perfect but so often we, we want to look at the stuff a dad isn't and we don't really focus on what he is. He got choked up easily like I do now. It bugged me then. I hated about myself. But anyway, it's okay. <laughs> but he was a great man. And I, I tell you, I'm in his shoes today. And so often I find myself saying exactly to my children, what he said to me. And they're not bad things either. Because he was a great dad who loved Jesus. And maybe you didn't have that kind of dad. But my mom this morning reminded me, you tell them if they didn't have a dad that God's their father. You know, a daughter who has a great relationship with the dad, she doesn't put up with stuff from another man. She doesn't do anything she doesn't want to do. She doesn't go out with jerks. She goes out with gentlemen. And, uh, and she's confident. And she leads. And, and she's admired because of that relationship with her dad. But when she doesn't have that, she spends the rest of her life looking for what she'll never, ever have. Until, as my mom said... She finds God, the Father, and allows him to heal that wound that is within. And then, then she can become the woman that God intended her to be. I don't say any of this to um, provoke shame or whatever. I'm just saying I think that what God wants from us today is to look at ourselves as fathers and yes, as mothers, and say, where are we messing up? And let's don't let these people die in vain. Let's say, God, the truth that you have given me is a truth I need to live by. And let's get better. You know, um, there's tremendous, tremendous hurt. And we need to uh, continue to pray for those folks that are dealing with tremendous hurt. There is healing though. Psalm 147.3 says, He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. And Isaiah 25.8 says, He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away all tears. Doesn't say um, He'll prevent the tears. We live in a fallen world where people with their freedom of choice may walk into a place that's sacred. And decide to use that choice to hurt others. But God is there for healing. You know, um, we do a, a healing is a choice workshop. And uh, a man wrote after going there, he said, I've given up hating my dad this weekend. I've given up all of that hatred to God. I can't handle it. But my Savior can. My father molested my two daughters when they were very small children. And he did it for several years without me knowing. I thank God for my supportive wife and pastor. Otherwise, I would be in jail for killing my father. I also gave up my hatred for my son-in-law who beat my daughter and my grandchildren. I'm grateful to finally get rid of the hatred. It was hurting me and no one else. We mourn for those, but God calls us to a life of transformation. And I don't know what you think you're entitled to feel when it comes to anger and bitterness, but God says uh, that's not the way to think. Romans 12, 2 says that we need to not conform to the thinking of this world, but literally be transformed by the renewing of our mind, by changing the way that we think is the way it's said. So many times we think we've got it. We think we're entitled to the, our anger, our unique situation. And God says, you've got to change that thinking and be transformed. And 
And he says to us in Ezekiel eleven nineteen, 19, I will take away their stony, stubborn heart and give them a tender and responsive heart. The strength of a dad with a tender and responsive heart is the model of God that he wants us to model to our children. And if we're not modeling that, we need to say, what is it inside of me? We need to have the the absolute um, courage to face the truth about ourselves. Be brave enough to confess it and open up to someone else about that truth so that we can be healed. James 5.16 says, confess your sins one to another. And pray for each other that you might be healed. It is all about openness that takes the power out of the secret. In our secrecy, we fuel all of these addictions and compulsions and and horrible things in our lives. But when we open up and confess the power of that secret sin, that secret obsession, that secret habit, it just, it does something. And it becomes something we can deal with, not something out of control. But first, we have to have the humility to open up and the courage to say what's there and the bravery to even see it, to be able to do it. We can be free of every bit of hatred and bitterness and resentment. A lot of people quote, well, the truth will set you free. Yeah, but in John 8, 31, 32, it says, if, and this is Jesus talking, if you follow my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then, or and, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. We're not free because we're not living the truth. We sit around and ask God, oh God, set me free, do the miracle. And God says, hey, why don't you just live the truth that I set before you? And the truth is that we are in every circumstance, if we want to be free, we are called to die to ourselves and to love other people. Die to our own uh, urges and triggers, our selfishness, our self-obsession. Die to what we think we deserve or entitled to. Die to our agenda and serve in love those people and to set that as the model for our, our sons and our daughters. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, when Christ calls someone, he bids them come and die. James 2.12 says, so whenever you speak or whatever you do, remember you will be judged by the law of love. That law that set you free. Wow, isn't that interesting? A law sets us free. It is a law of love. There's not lawlessness in freedom where we're entitled to do anything we want to do, but the law of love is the law that says no matter where you are or what you're doing or what you're struggling with, love is the path back to the heart of God and And the person that is willing to do whatever it takes, that stands in their way of loving other people, that's the person that's living according to God's truth. Stop waiting for God to do what God is waiting for you to do, and that is to live into His truth. All of us, most of us have a GPS in our car or on our phone, and no matter where you are, it'll get you where you want to be. And love is God's GPS. The next right thing to do is either love somebody with everything you are or figure out what it is standing in your way of that love. And standing in the way are our bitternesses, our resentments, our hatreds, our racism, our prejudice. And if we have any shadow of what fueled that murderous act, then we need to leave it right here today. I believe that's what God is calling us to do. We can be angry. We can be upset. We can mourn for them. But what good is that if we don't ask God, what does it mean for me? What is 
being reflected from my heart? Is it you and your love? Or is it me? Me. Me. I, I'm so grateful at a church so full of love. You see it everywhere you go in this church. I see it in my small group. I see it everywhere. I see it out in the lobby when people are coming in. But I know that some of you brought some junk in here. And you need to clean that up. And I pray you'll do it. In honor of God, the Father on Father's Day, in honor of nine people who lost their lives, so faithful that on a Wednesday night they were up at church. I pray that you'll do it in honor of your family. There is nothing more powerful than forgiving someone on Father's Day or a father asking for forgiveness and saying, I'm going to do a better job. So when the time comes, you know, if you need to get the power out of some of those secrets, there'll be people here you can talk to. Confess your sins one to another and pray for each other that you might be healed. I want to pray for that that wonderful group, that wonderful church in Charleston. And I want to pray for us. So... um, Bow your heads with me if you would. Lord, we do pray for those families who are hurting, trying to understand it all, coming to grips with a life that will never be the same. And Lord, um, we pray for the, the family of this boy and his dad who who probably feel so much shame today. And Lord, it's hard for me, but I pray for them. I pray for them and I pray for their healing. I repeat the the voice of one of those moms who said to him, Lord, have mercy on your soul. God, for each of us here who came in with this bitterness and resentment and anger, thinking we are so entitled to it, who have shown our children something other than your love and acceptance and mercy, Lord, help us to have the courage to face that within ourselves. Be brave enough to open up to someone else. And renew our commitment to live in your truth and follow the law of love that sets us free. God, thank you for a second chance. Thank you for your mercy. And thanks for being our Father. All powerful, all loving all we ever need.